Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. You are listening to Coast to Coast AM. Hello there. Connie Willis with you. If you would like to join me anywhere else, please go to ConnieWillis.com. That's where you can find me. I've got some shows there, different types of shows you can be a part of. They are membership shows. We have a good time. You can become a cadet and join me for Connie After Dark. That is where you can have a drink with me or not. We just sit and, and talk and laugh and have a good time for a couple hours and it uh, ends up going to my other show blue rock talk which is where we take you to live investigations of creepy hotspots that are active and we're batting a thousand we got some new members in and i want to welcome you to become a blue rocker so thanks so much for joining all right so um one of um well i've taught i've taught our guest tonight i've talked to him several different times uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long, you've heard him here on Coast to Coast many times. He's been on my other shows, too. One of the nicest people in the world and extremely intelligent, still has that sense of humor as well. And I enjoy talking to him so much. I talked to her, him earlier today, and you know we're going to be talking about near-death experiences and, and the afterlife and uh, the things that kind of go along with that. And a lot of people can go, you know, yeah, I've heard that. I get it. Okay. All right. I know. I know. But uh, Jeff and I talked today and we were like, let's take this somewhere else with it. And he's like, you know what? Good timing, Connie. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. So he's a leading, he is a leading near-death experience researcher and New York Times bestselling author. This like, he's the real deal. He founded the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. That is the N-D-E-R-F dot org. So if you want to follow along. Uh, two other websites devoted to this. Uh, one is After Death Communication Research Foundation. So I, he, he did really well getting these website domains. I'm pretty good at that. And so he did pretty good getting this, adcrf.org. You can always go to our website at coasttocoastam.com, and you can also find these um, domains. And also Out of Body Experience Research Foundation, oberf.org. So the family of websites, they're the largest publicly accessible collection of exceptional human experiences of their type available. So let's go ahead and bring on Dr. Jeffrey Long, who, by the way, Jeffrey, you are like all about the largest of everything you do. So I just want to compliment you on that. And you deserve an award for always having the largest of everything. That you do. <laughs> go big or go home, right? <laughs> oh, that, I love it, Connie. Uh, yeah, it's true. Uh, on the NDERF.org website, over 4,000 near-death experiences, exactly like you said, by far the largest publicly accessible collection of near-death experiences in the world, free to browse, uh, dramatically informative and inspirational to anybody that just wants to check it out. And also one that, you know, I can say uh, that people can find easily where they don't have to go, what, what was that? What was that acronym? Um, the Institute, what is it? Spiritualityandhealth.org. That's a easy one to find too. And that can lead you to the other ones, can't it? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. we're all, we're all interconnected. <laughs> That's great. You got, you got more websites than me. You go. <laughs> You have done amazing work. You have seen, uh, being an oncologist, you have seen people at the very end of their life leave this world and then literally come back and tell you about it. Yeah, absolutely. You just defined a near-death experience right there, and that happens. It's an imminent life-threatening event, and then there's an experience at that time when they're so physically uncompromised, they're unconscious or clinically dead, shouldn't have any remembrance at all, and yet they do. And by the thousands, probably around the world, millions of people have had near-death experiences. 
What was um, the longest that you've seen and the shortest that you've seen of people go on the other side and then come back? And were they distinctly for sure seeing something, the shortest amount of time and the longest amount? Oh, that's great. Uh, short's pretty easy. You can have people that like have a car wreck and they're unconscious maybe just for seconds. And during that time, they can have a fairly brief near-death experience. They have a common first element out-of-body experience, their consciousness above their body, seeing the horrific wreck below them and often people trying to resuscitate them, bring them back to life. So those are short ones, relatively short near-death experiences. Now, the really long ones, especially common if people are unconscious or approaching clinical death for a prolonged period of time, uh, their time in their near-death experience can be defined as like literally it seems in terms of earthly time hours. Although you always have to remember that in the afterlife that they describe in near-death experiences, essentially always those having those experiences say time is either radically different from earthly time or time simply doesn't exist on the other side. But staying on this side, what is the longest someone has gone that they were out and then they came back? Right. I had a a child drowning in cold water, and that was about 45 minutes documented in the water. So that's, I mean, uh, the combination of being a child and and having cold water and drowning, that sort of chills the body down and allows them to have a better chance of recovering. So that's sort of the life-threatening event circumstance where you've got the possibility of the longest, if you will, being in a coma, unconscious, and, and yet are able to be successfully resuscitated. Okay, yeah, I was trying to figure out, you know, if you are in that, you know, if somebody's in that situation with you, you know, you always see people doing CPR for a long time. It's like, when when do you know to stop? When do you know that it's over? When some people come back, do they always come back because the doctors are trying or just boom on their own? They can, uh, at the end of a near-death experience, most of the time they simply spontaneously return to their physical body, but at other wow. times, there's a decision with other spiritual beings. And hey, Connie, this is fascinating. Uh, for people that have near-death experiences that make a decision, the great majority of time, they don't want to leave that unearthly, if you will, beautiful, heavenly realm. I mean, think about it. Even though their whole earthly life, that they've known decades of earthly life, it is such an engrossing, strong sense of love, peace. And in a near-death experience in that unearthly wor- realm, they actually feel that that's their real home. So very, Mm -hmm. very difficult for people that are in a near-death experience to choose to come back to their earthly life and all the pain and difficulties that we all know in our earthly life. And what they're going to have to deal with, I mean, because if they were in a car accident or something, they're going to have to deal with, you know, that much more pain than they had, you know, just having to deal with the recovery. Oh, oh, absolutely. And some of the severe life-threatening events that cause a near-death experience. I mean, this can be lasting physical or mental debility, depending on what got injured and severity of their accident or illness that led to the near-death experience. So uh, hats off to the heroic near-death experiencers who are doing that during their experience, make that very, very difficult decision, uh, often with other beings with them, to return to their earthly life and fight to recover from that close brush with death. You have seen so much, though. When did you, what what happened the first time? I know we're going to get into some deeper stuff, but I got to ask you some of these other things I've always wanted to ask you. When, when was the first time you started seeing this and you went, oh my goodness. I mean, did you start out like a regular doctor and that little scientific mind of, no, there's nothing on the other side? Did you were you ever that way in the first place? Because you may not have been. But when did you go? Oh my gosh! They literally saw something, and it's this is you know. When did you start getting it that there was something on the other side and it wasn't over? Yeah, you know that's a great question, Connie. I was actually in my residency training over decades ago in my medical specialty, radiation oncology. And that was pre-internet era, so if we wanted to find an article about cancer, we had to go to the medical library and go through these huge bound volumes. So there I am flipping through the journal of the American Medical Association, very prominent medical journal, 
and completely by accident found an article which had in its title, Near-Death Experience. And I paused. I'd never heard of such a thing. There was nothing in my medical training that suggested that was even possible. I mean, you're either alive or dead. So fascinated, I actually stopped looking for my cancer article and read the article and was immediately fascinated. I mean, Connie, how can you not be fascinated about wondering what happens after we die? Mm -hmm. So upon reading this article, I uh, broke off from read the bibliography and looked up a few other articles and said, geez, if this is real, if near-death experiences are real, this changes my view of the universe. There, there's something big going on. And it was really... Um, about a year later, I had a college friend meet me, and, and his wife was there. And just over supper, his wife said that she had severe allergies, so bad, in fact, that she actually died, coded, heart stopped while she was under anesthesia. But she said it kind of funny, and my medical instincts kicked in, and I was ready to ask the dumbest question in my life. And here she was <laughs> under anesthesia during getting surgery, and, and her heart stopped. It should be absolutely impossible, Connie, to have any remembrance at that time, but I was intrigued and asked her, well, did anything happen? And she said, why, yes. And I heard my first in-person near-death experience and a very classic detailed one, consciousness over the body, watching the uh, operating room team frantically trying to resuscitate her, the racket that the EKG measure of electrical heart activity makes when it goes flat. It's got an alarm, obviously. Classic near-death experience through a tunnel, met deceased loved ones, but she didn't know what she had. She didn't know what happened. So I told her, well, gee, I, I read about that about a year ago. I think you had a near-death experience. So I was hooked and became determined to find out for myself from original source of evidence, question that was now burning in my mind, are near-death experiences for real? Well, you know, at one point, this was years and years and years ago, I remember seeing a documentary where they were talking about this, and they had actually set something up. I wonder if it was you. <laughs> they set something up in the um, surgery rooms, I guess you'd call it, and they had, uh, like, on top of some of the machines or some sort of file cabinet or some type of thing where there was, like, maybe an X or some sort of symbol where if anybody does come back, they could say they saw that. And the patient would have never known that that was up there in the first place. But when they mentioned it later after they came back, it was pretty astonishing. Was that something? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, oh absolutely. That's called placing a target. These are the so-called prospective near-death experience studies. And a usual methodology for these type of studies is actually like a laptop. And it flashes through different colors. It cycles through about four different colors, four different pictures, and four different words or phrases. So the thinking is, uh, and that's all shown at random. So if people can have a near-death experience and that so-called out-of-body experience with consciousness apart from the body, and they place this, uh, the laptop with these, uh, these target images basically face up, but away from where anybody in the operating room or emergency room can see, and ask people that have a life-threatening event if they had a near-death experience, and if they did, did you see the target? So there's been about five or six of those studies that have been done so far. Were you a part of one of those? No, I've, I've certainly read about them. Uh, there are certainly my colleagues uh, that have done these studies, but I haven't. I'd love to participate in that. I mean, that would just be absolutely fantastic. But yeah, well, you know what? Tomorrow night, I got a guy on tomorrow night, um, Regan Forsen. And he helps, he regresses people to go to heaven and then brings them back. And he said there's like 250 people that know how to do it in the world. They're looking for more people to be able to do it. But they say you can be on the other side, ask all the questions you want with everybody that you meet, and then come back. So you might want to be here tomorrow listening to that. Oh, Connie, I'm all in for that show. That's, <laughs> I'm, 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 that's, that's, Isn't that cool? Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for tipping me off about that. That was super. Yeah, that's great. Sleep in in the morning, then come back. So um, I got a lot of people asking me today to ask you about animals. What do you know about animals in near-death experiences? Great question. Uh, it's not at all unusual during a near-death experience to encounter a deceased human loved one. 
And in near-death experiences, they generally appear in these unearthly, if you will, heavenly realms. And it's a joyous reunion, even if the relationship was strained during earthly life. They're essentially always in picture-perfect health, that being these deceased humans, even if they died of chronic disfiguring illness or, or advanced age. And uh, that's a very dramatic part of about, oh, about 20% of near-death experiences describe that. But hey, Connie, this is the great news. Uh, as a, an animal lover, I have two dogs. They're over and over, we're seeing in near-death experience encounters with deceased beloved pets, again, mm -hmm. in that unearthly realm. And again, like the deceased human loved ones, here are their deceased beloved pets. Picture perfect health, joyous reunion, a lot of interaction. I mean, you name it, I've seen it. Uh, dogs, cats, birds, horses, uh, deceased pets of all types. Uh, they're beautifully in the near-death experience again. A very powerful message that that which we love will ultimately be reunited with, whether it's your human beloved ones or your beloved pets. And it's not just in your mind like a lot of people want to look at and say, that's just your mind remembering things. You're saying, no, this is what's happening when you cross over. Yeah, absolutely. We've had people encounter other people in near-death experiences that they didn't even know were dead or that were even in a life-threatening situation. And they mm. may interact with them and sometimes even ask, well, why are you here? Uh, what's going on? Because, of course, virtually always in a beings, humans that they knew are essentially always deceased when they're encountered in near-death experience in that unearthly realm. So uh, it's not just the mind if you're encountering somebody that you didn't even know was dead, didn't even know was in a life cri a crisis of their health or having an accident, and then only when they recover from their life-threatening event, check it out, they go, oh, wow, that person died prior to my near-death experience, and I didn't even know it. That's a classic example of information in near-death experiences that they absolutely could not have known other than having a near-death experience. It's, it's not all in the mind. There's many, many lines of evidence like that for the reality of near-death experience. Out-of-body experience, near-death experience. What's the difference? An out-of-body experience you d occurs when you, you, you don't necessarily have to have a life-threatening event. Um, people can induce them, uh, often through meditation. They can occur spontaneously, often dramatically described. But like near-death experiences, it involves conscious perception, that being what you see, what you hear, apart from the physical body, typically above the physical body. And from that vantage point, they can, uh, either with uh, spontaneous out-of-body experiences or near-death experience types, uh, we'll call them OBEs, so for both types of experiences, uh, very dramatic. You can see here events around the physical body. And interestingly, we have in my research literally scores of people who had that out-of-body experience and came back with observations. They saw things. They heard things far from their geographic body. And I mean like it could be over a mile. And they can see and hear things in great detail. And then when they check it out, after they are resuscitated and recover, almost invariably what they saw, what they heard, accurate down to the finest detail. I know you were talking about at one point free will, where we have free will all the time. However, so, so talk about what, you know, what you've learned about that. But also the second part of that is free will when it comes to coming back or not. Uh, y yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's fascinating to me, Connie, that over and over we have quotes in near-death experiences where people have gotten very direct information during their near-death experience about free will. And it's not just the near-death experiencer's free will. It's free will for everybody worldwide. Uh, near-death experiences have shared, and this is straight quotes from their experiences, uh, I felt like it's all about free will or the one law that will never change is the law of free will, the one law uh, that lasts. Uh, and then finally, another near-death experiencer said, we are products of our own choices, our free will. So uh, over and over, literally by the scores, we have people in getting this important information very relevant for each and every one of us in our earthly life. And exciting, too, to uh, have that kind of validation that the decisions we make 
uh, what we choose to do really is ultimately our own free will choice. So that's exciting. Did did um, when when you're on the other side, have have some people wanted to totally stay, and they're like, no, you got more to do, and they're like fighting it. So to me, that would be like, oh, wait a minute, my free wills, I want to stay. <laughs> but, you know, that's a great question. Uh, we had somebody heroically review the literally thousands of near-death experiences on the website, and their goal was to uh, explore what we see over and over again, and that being, again, while on the other side, near-death experiencers at the end of their near-death experience being told language like, it's not your time, you have more to do, you have more work to do. And the interestingly, this study, the huge study that was uh, recently completed, by the way, this is uh, you're the first in the world, you and, and all your listeners, to hear the results of this study. Amazingly, worldwide, about 10 to 12 percent of near-death experiencers have, at the end of their experience, that kind of uh, information. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing to me here, here they're being told that you know, while they could stay in that beautiful, unearthly, blissful, loving realm, earthly life seems to be so important that they're being sent back because they have more to do, because they have more life to live. Uh, and the interesting thing about this study, Connie, is that this was from all around the world, even in non-Western countries. That same concept was universal wherever on the planet you are. And so as a result of that, you know, we're back to that free will. We seem to not only have the free will to, to choose our what we do in our life, but there seems to be a direction from the other side. Now, I want to emphasize that when they're told to come back, you have more work to do, there's things left in your life, language like that, almost never are the near-death experiencers told specifically what to do. Uh, they're not told to go build an ark. They're not told what Man, to Man, come on. I mean, what they're, good they're is not, that? Yeah, I know. That, that, <laughs> Tell us. You know, early in my study of near-death experiences, that, that made me nuts. I'm going, well, come on. What are, what's important? What are we supposed to do? And I, yeah. Finally, after, you know, having this, like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times uh, with near-death experiences out of the 4,000 that are on the website. Said, okay, Did you shake them? Yeah, that, Did you, yeah, Jeff? You know, come I, on. I think, they, I think they know what they're doing on the other side. Okay, I, I get it. So if, if we have free will, that, that might potentially interfere if we're given direction or told what to do. So again, you know, sort of that exciting concept. And, you know, yet another significant line of reality of near-death experience is that, that critical spiritual concept that our lives are that meaningful that – we come back that there's more to do on this earth, that it's important uh, that our work isn't complete at, uh, during a near-death experience is, is fascinating. You know, you may laugh at this or you may not. I don't know. Uh, I hope you laugh at this, but it's pretty serious too. But I was going, I was having a surgery and the anesthesiologist was talking to me ahead of time and she introduced herself to me and and I don't know if that's normal or not. I yeah, I guess so. I guess so. But it was right before it happened. I know they usually meet you the day before or something like that, if I remember correctly. Maybe it's always different. But I met her. She was talking away. We were having a good time talking. And I said, <laughs> little old me going, hey, do you think you can take me to the, you know, right there at the light. I just want to go right to the light. I would just want to step over enough to get some psychic abilities and then come back. Just make sure I come back, but please, can you get me to the light? She did not like that at all. She thought it was crazy, but she didn't like that at all. But I was, I was serious. Oh, that, that's fascinating. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Hey, I did laugh. That's good. Uh, good. When you talk to anesthesiologists, just don't call them gas passers. Um, oh. But, uh, yeah, that that would be interesting. I mean, you know, and and I'm sure she didn't like that at all. But she didn't talk yeah, to me yeah. anymore. She yeah, she did. <laughs> okay, she, she gave me a dirty look and walked on. <laughs> Part of the anesthesia right away there, Connie. That, <laughs> but you but know, I was again, totally serious. In fact, that's my que uh, the next question to you is: How many people come back and you notice that they do have some sort of psychic abilities? Oh, we see that quite commonly. In fact, it's a survey question that we've asked our literally thousands of near death experiencers. Uh, that being, did you have any psychic or paranormal gifts after your near-death experience? And well over half of the people surveyed say, yes, yes, we did. And it's all over the board. They can be increasingly intuitive. Uh, they can be increasingly, um, you know, a whole, whole 
array of psychic phenomena have been described as part of that. Uh, what we call Are you cooking after- dinner okay. over there while, while we're talking? Are you cooking dinner over there? Is that what's oh, going on? No, you know what? My two dogs came running downstairs <laughs> because they were aware okay. that I'm here. We got a German shepherd and a Dutch shepherd, and they decided <laughs> to come visit me. So, hey, we were talking oh. earlier about pets in the afterlife. Uh, so here's, just to uh, reinforce that, here's two dogs. <laughs> but they're still very alive and active. I love that. I love that. I'm sorry. It's radio. When you hear those little things, you got to know, what is that? What's going on over there? What's happening? Well, the dog came down, saw me, and actually was kind enough to bring a ball. Oh, well, there you got to throw it. Go ahead and throw it. I, I understand. Okay. <laughs> so so it's interesting, the people you said, um, how, what's the percentage that you all found out? that? Uh, yeah, it's well over half of the people okay. have the psychic, this, this variety of psychic phenomena. And, and again, fascinating can certainly be a significant change in their life afterwards. And that's the people that recognize it and admit to it. So there could be more, and maybe they didn't recognize it yet even, you know? You know, and that's a really good point. I think the change is maybe gradual sometimes. It, well, in fact, often it takes years after their near-death experience to fully integrate those major changes that occur. And so they could have a slow progression of being increasingly psychic over years even and, and just not recognize it because, gee, they, their psychic ability today seems about like the way it was yesterday or a week ago. And yet other people with them will say, hey, you're more intuitive. It's almost like, uh, geez, it's like we share a brain. You know what I'm going to say. You know when the phone's going to ring. You you have that sort of intuitive psychic uh, sixth sense that you didn't have before. And, and you can hear that sometimes, if not from the near-death experiencers, the people close to them in their lives. I think it's amazing when people can, like, play Beethoven or something on the piano all of a sudden. And, like, where'd this come from? Yeah. I don't know. I'm 68. Yeah, very, I don't know very, what's going on. <laughs> absolutely. Very famous near-death experiencer coming back with, I mean, there's just seemingly no end to how those changes can be after the near-death experience. But so often very profound, right? We had a very prominent near-death experiencer came back and was an accomplished uh, piano player and had no interest wow. in that before. You know, just one more example of those kind of amazing psychic, if you will, changes that occur after an experience. Well, when they're told to go back, you've got more to do. Does that look more like, like you know, you say free will, but then is it fate? Is it destiny? Is, you know, because if you've got more to do, was that your free will to still do that or not, but you're being taken back to do that. Um, so free will, fate, destiny, um, what would the other thoughts be? Or is it also, hey, I was here before, and before I decided to come back to Earth again, I decided I was going to do five things, and I haven't done those five things yet. You know? Yeah, bingo. It's what you just said at the end there. I think it's what's going on. Near-death experiences don't point, at least in general, to a fixed fate. In other words, there seems to be the ability through free will, through the meaning and purpose of our earthly lives that we, that we can choose, that we can decide what we want to do and then you know, live either for good or for ill, those choices we make in, the, in, in our life. But over and over, there's a huge amount of evidence from near-death experiences that we actually existed as very conscious entities in that unearthly heavenly realm prior to coming here on earthly life. Uh, at that point in time, as near-death experiencers over and over describe, consciousness is greatly accelerated, you were, if you will, uh, much smarter, much more uh, conscious, much more aware in that, if you will, spiritual consciousness prior to coming to Earth. And in that consciousness, we were able to decide, well, number one, to come to our earthly life and, and live an earthly life here. But number two, often perhaps some ideas about, in general, what that earthly life might be. And so that seems to be, if you will, agreements or made before we come to our earthly life, or uh, you know, it might be you know, something that, that is important for our individual spiritual growth on the other side. We have certain things to experience, and uh, while, while we're not directed as to what to do in our earthly life, we certainly have some guiding principles the reality of an afterlife, the reality we hear over and over, the importance of love, and certainly as we've been discussing, the concept of free will. Jeff, it's so nice to talk to someone that's got a Ph.D. that works as as you do, uh, the education, um, 
and you'll talk about past lives, regression, near death, what's on the other side, um, psychic abilities. I could talk to, like I have a neighbor, I, I believe he's an anesthesiologist assistant, I am absolutely sure if I said something to him about this, he would just turn and walk away. Uh, that's you know, so sad. It, it is. Oh. It is. I know. I know uh, professors that will they will hide it if they even think something. Uh, but they walk away. And I'm, I met a doctor at lunch at one point. I'm just eating lunch. She's sitting next to me. We start talking, and she she went to Yale, and and she was just talking about what all she knew and I said at one point finally I said do you want to know what I do (laughs) because she talked the whole time (laughs) about her stuff and I'm listening I'm good but as soon as I told her she asked for the check and she (laughs) was ready to leave and she kept telling me to do my homework and before she left before she hit the the doors I walked over to her and I said hey before you leave do your homework on what I'm telling you oh Absolutely. That really makes a difference. You know, it's so sad. I mean, gosh, honey, Connie, listen to what we're talking about here. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. Strong, powerful evidence that we don't really die, that there's life after death, that there's a wonderful afterlife for all of us. I mean, amazing evidence, amazingly powerful, powerfully positive messages. You'd think people would at least want to check it out. Uh, and, and I think yeah. your yeah, I mean, good gosh. But the good news is, Shows like you do, you know, Connie, your outreach to the world in a, in a wide variety of ways through your podcast and everything, it's making a difference. Good. And there's a major survey done by what's called Pew Forum. And in 2021, a survey they did about what people thought about the afterlife had the amazing statistic that 72% of Americans actually believed that near-death experiences were an actual soul departing from the physical body. We're getting the word out. People are listening. People are understanding. And, and uh, are literally the significant majority of people in America now believe that near-death experiences are real. So, you know, shows like this, it's making a difference. So I got to ask you this. Do, um, what, do you, what's, what do you know that's on the other side? Are you like uh, angels, uh, aliens? Are you open to all that kind of thing? Well, that's what, again, having studied 4,000 near-death experiences, I've seen all that. Um, People, you know, angels have been described. They typically, at least the great majority, don't have wings. They're sort of not like a sort of a classic appearance. And yet they are, in in a very real sense, what's important about angels. They're profoundly loving. They're there for the other person. There can be dialogues, interactions. So uh, very dramatic and very beautiful descriptions of encountering beings on the other side, which many near-death experiencers call angels. So that, that's certainly an important part of near-death experiences. Do you, I'm not sure of your background when it comes to spirit, spirituality or religious, or do you see any, uh, like in the Bible, are you seeing like, oh my gosh, what we saw here fits this, what we saw here fits that, anything oh. like that? Absolutely, over and over. Uh, first and foremost, I respect everybody's spiritual path, whatever it might be. And I've seen a lot of different people on different walks of life, but we're all, I think, going in the same direction. Actually, um, one near-death experiencer asked uh, on the other side, met what he described as God, and asked about religions and was shown a mountain where people were climbing up the mountain, but they were climbing up different sides of the mountain. And the point that was trying to be made to this person during their near-death experiences, we're all on the same spiritual path. We're all going toward that top of the mountain, even if we're not aware of other people. But at the end, we're all the same. We're up at the top. There's there's the same destination of our journey, that spiritual home. So I'm I'm very interested, certainly, in the Bible. I've been uh, actually I was asked to write a foreword for uh, a major sort of religious publication called Guideposts, and I actually wrote about love in near-death experiences and, you know, throughout the Bible, many, many beautiful quotes about love, many, many beautiful quotes about love from people that had near-death experiences. So again, it's always kind of a, ah, moment when you realize just how it all seems to fit together, whatever the journey we have or whatever our belief system is. 
Love. Even here, it's the only thing that's real. It's not fabricated. It is not man-made. It's the one thing that is real here. Absolutely. Oh, oh, absolutely. And in fact, in my survey of 834 near-death experiencers for our most recent version of the survey, hey, Connie, I asked him directly, did you, during your experience, encounter any information or awareness about love? And it was like close to 60% said yes. And then the narrative response to that question just about knocked me out of my chair. I mean, over and over, uh, love they encountered on the other side that's beyond anything they knew on Earth, uh, the only force that's real. It's the glue that holds the universe together. I mean, just yeah. profound insights about love from near-death experiencers. Jeff, we were talking about love at the very uh, last segment. I'd love for you to explain any more about love that you can, because I. it sounds like that's the most important thing you've found out of all of this. Oh, oh Connie, you are so right about that. The two most common words used by people describing their near-death experience is love and light. So we mm. hear a lot about that in near-death experiences, and they are absolutely dramatic and exciting. Um, we did have a survey question. The most recent version of the survey interviewed 834 people that had a near-death experience. Survey question during your experience, that being a near-death experience, did you encounter any specific information or awareness regarding love? And good gosh, Connie, 57.1% said yes. So it's mm -hmm. very common for people during their experience to have some special insights or knowledge. And, and what they have to say about love, again, I just love reading about this, to use a term, uh, straight from near-death experiencers. I knew that love was the greatest force around us and that we are all love, and love is the only thing that is real. And another mm. near-death experiencer shared, love was everywhere. It permeated the afterlife. It was incredible. Connie, we have hundreds of these types of quotes of descriptions of love from near-death experiencers, you know, absolutely off the charts in terms of uh, beauty and, and amazing concepts about love. If only we could accomplish that in our earthly lives. But Certainly in the afterlife, a major sort of glue, if you will, of the whole afterlife seems to be this unearthly, fantastic love. I love to be able to educate people on that because, you know, to hear you say those things and to hear when I've talked to people that have crossed over and come back, I did it, but I was like four and a half years old, so I don't remember all that stuff. I just remember what I saw at our uh, accident, car accident scene uh, that that I was involved in. I remember seeing everything. Uh, that I should not have ever seen. I should have been on my way. And my dad was like, no, you're on the way to the hospital. You know, it's like, no, I remember seeing you there, dad. But I love hearing when people discuss the love part and you just got to wonder, is that this like driving thing in our life uh, while we're here? And also the bigger part of educating people and spreading that word is because there's so many people that fear death. Oh, absolutely. Fear of death is unfortunately one of the real uh, issues that we collectively as humans have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, that fear of the unknown or what's going to happen. And yet here by the thousands, literally, people share their near-death experience and, and talk about what it's life on the, like on the other life, what it's beyond death's veil. And over and over you hear, as we discuss this concept of love, uh, again, from near-death experiencers, I was loved unconditionally despite my faults and fears, and the entire experience was one of unfathomable lo love from another near-death experiencer. So very uh, inspiring, positive information coming from near-death experiences about what lies beyond. Certainly for the near-death experiencers themselves, Connie, they have a dramatic reduction in their fear of death after their near-death experience. Uh, well, you know, death is frightening if you have a near-death experience and know full well from your personal experience what lies beyond the veil. Uh, the, the great majority of near-death experiencers no longer fear death. They may fear, of course, the dying process, but they know full well what lies beyond and, and that it's a wonderful, a wonderful afterlife that awaits us all. You know, though, okay, so you're you're on the front lines of all this, okay? You are right there in the room with them. You are there. Okay, so let me ask you this. You get on the other side, there's love, it's wonderful, all oh, that's great. Me, that's awesome, I get it. I've 
Love that. What I don't like is, especially after taking care of parents and seeing other people uh, at the end of their life, the hard part for me is that part before you die, that is, whether it's dementia, Parkinson's, um, whatever disease you may have or whatever takes you out, uh, even if it's an, an accident of some sort, the pain of it, the uh, long time in the hospital, uh, the people that gradually uh, uh, fall apart, the fact that, uh, you know, and, and you've probably seen this. I know you've seen this when you're in ICU and you yeah. see a whole different personality of a person and it, you know it's not the person you know. And, you know, they're trying to escape. They have to be tied down, that kind of thing. What, you know, it makes me go back to the movie Charlton Heston's Soylent Green, where people can decide when they're going to go. They take the pill and then they lay there in the orange room or the red room or whatever color room they want with the the video of nature or whatever as they fall asleep and never wake back up. Mm, Yeah. That's the hard part is the dying part. Yeah, it really is. You know, and Connie, as a physician who takes care of patients with cancer, I see that vividly every day in my professional practice. And it's a tragedy. You know, dementia, that failing of people that are advanced age, and the the failing at the end of life of the ones we love, the ones we care about. Here they are, diminished mental status, uh, often very difficult to get with. I think one thing to consider as we see that is that in the afterlife, uh, basically, there is none of that death, that dementia. Uh, we're right. all picture perfect health in the afterlife. Uh, we're all right, all the, the, the loved ones who have lost their personality, their ability to reason. That's all going to be restored in the afterlife. In fact, they're going to have a much, much greater consciousness, alertness, and mentition, uh, greatly accelerated consciousness compared to our earthly life. So, it's a it's a tough. A slog to go through our earthly life. In fact, one near-death experiencer said that our earthly life was the boot camp of our spiritual eternal existence. Mm. And I like that because I think that's so true. But I think, on the other hand, that when you see the people that are, are suffering like that and miserable near the end of the life, isn't that, Connie, also a call for the rest of us to reach out to them lovingly, compassionately, to care for them, uh, to do the best we can for them, to help them make that transition at the end of their earthly life and that glorious afterlife. And I think you would just, think, yeah, you would think just, not everybody does, right? But do yeah. you, since you are on the front line, do you ever think, you know what? And I'm not, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. I just know I've seen this, and it's really hard, and yeah. it is not fun. And I, I just the other day, I was taking a walk and. There was a lady, an older lady that I know that she still walks around. I, I'd seen her stop and and lean up against a pole. And I walked up to her and it was the lady I actually knew. And I was like, how are you? You okay? And she used to be an RN. And she's like, uh, I don't know, maybe upper 80s, lower 90s. And she's still, you know, fit and walking around. But she had to stop. And she said, I think I just had a dementia moment. And she was there by herself alone. Other people walking by her as if she didn't exist. And I, thank goodness, I knew who she was and went up to her and saw her because I could see that she was afraid for that moment. So being on the front lines as as you are and knowing it's good on the other side, do you ever think, hey, we need to stop this three months, six months, two years, uh, three days of suffering that is just absolutely horrible? Um, yeah. do you ever think like, you know, we take our animals and we put them to sleep so they don't go through that? Have you ever, has that ever been a thought with you? Yeah. Um, you know, euthanasia or terminating life early is a very complex societal issue. Yeah. Uh, there's certainly some strong arguments both for and against that. I certainly know from my experience with cancer patients when they're incurable when their cancer's progressing and, and we can't cure it with the best of our medical knowledge and, and treatment techniques, at least for these people. And, and it's true for other people that are near the end of the, their life. I'm absolutely impressed as a physician with hospice. In other words, the people who are specially trained yeah. and skilled and experienced at helping people make that 
end-of-life transition. It is absolutely amazing to me how people can be kept as comfortable as possible and as functional as possible even when they're within days, uh, even weeks of, of their life ending. So certainly, while well, the, the dying process can be very, very difficult, yeah. and certainly as you've described, medicine and certainly the compassion of society is all kind of converging on making that easier than it ever has been in the past. So it's really fascinating to think. And I guess part of it is if, if you have a loved one in your life that, that's going through that very difficult end-of-life situation, it, it's hard to remember this, but it's a great truth that our earthly life is only the tiniest slice of our real eternal existence. And I know that's hard to accept or understand for people that, that are in a dying process, and yet it's a great reality. I mean, everything we shared today talks about that afterlife, who we really are, what we really are, is that destiny, that heritage that we have in the afterlife where we're much, much more than we are in our limited physical earthly life. Blink of an eye here. Enjoy it. Love, love, love. Live for yourself, not for others. And speaking of that, I want to ask you about, because you said on the other side, animals and and relatives and spouses and this and that. Um, What about those people that are here their spouse passes, their widows and widowers. A lot of people ask me this question of, okay, can I remarry again? Is it okay? Because, uh, and even the people that date the widow and widowers, they're they're like, well, wait a minute, I'm going to be with them a couple years or 10 years or two decades or however long it is. And then they're just going to see their spouse on the other side. What happens with me? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I want to be hanging around a threesome kind of thing, right? What What about that where people don't feel that they're allowed to marry again after uh, their spouse passes? What do you know about that from the other side? Oh, absolutely, Connie. That is a very important question. I'm glad you brought that up. There are some definitely insights from near-death experiences that address that important question In the afterlife, it's non-physical. I mean, it's hard for people to understand that here in our physical earthly life existence that the afterlife is so radically different, time doesn't exist. It's not really physical. People have described it as energy, but it's a completely different realm. In that realm, uh, we're part of our eternal existence. Eternity is a heck of a long time compared to the uh, bit of time we have here in our earthly life. And in in the afterlife, Again, love is predominant. You would want the best. uh, For those that have died and gone on and are in the afterlife, you'd want only your best for that spouse that you've left here in the earthly life. I mean, you know that uh, that earthly life is difficult. Uh, They have to have grieving from the loss of that loved one. I I am confident that that the people in the afterlife that have lost a spouse would, would have no concerns at all, in fact, would welcome them having an ongoing additional loving relationship during their earthly life, uh, a loving relationship so that they can share with other people, share love, uh, which is so important in the afterlife, and and just get the most out of their physical earthly life during the time we have. So I'm quite confident from, from everything in near-death experiences that that's part of the greater reality. And I hope people that have lost a loved one and worry about you know, remarrying, worry about getting in a relationship, uh, the word from the other side, as best I can tell, it's not only okay, but it is absolutely okay. And and that's the reassuring news from near-death, ex- near-death experiences. That's nice. That's nice to hear. So you've learned so much. I know that imprinting is a very important thing to do if you're in situations, if you've already imprinted how to uh, handle certain situations in life, if you've already imprinted the answers and resolutions or, you know, whatever you need to do. Like if I go down a dark alley uh, and somebody approaches me and they do this, this is what I need to do. You, you know, you imprint uh, in your mind what to do because you're going to be in a situation of you can't think, you just got to do, right? So mm-hmm. you, <laughs> what do you have imprinted in your mind that if something happened to you where you crossed over and, uh, you know, what what would you do if it was like 
just today, you know, would you say, I want to come back, I want to come back, I want to see it all, and I want to come back, or or what would you do? Oh, what have you got question. in your mind? <laughs> and I hadn't really thought about that much. I can tell you from the over 4,000 people that have shared their near-death experiences, I have no fear of what lies beyond death's door. Right. I absolutely get that based on a mountain of evidence that, that the afterlife is a reality. So I would, at some significant way, welcome being back, what literally back home, back in my real yes. eternal afterlife, spiritual life. So I've been mm-hmm. being with, with the loved ones that I've known in my earthly life that have lost. So I think I would welcome that a great deal. Um, we'd have that profound sense of love, connection, unity that near-death experiencers consistently describe. And yet, I think I have to balance that, that I would, I mean, gosh, in, in all my decades of life, I've gotten kind of attached to my earthly life I and mean, the people I know, <laughs> loved ones. Um, you know, I, gosh, like I love shows like this, too, for example. And so it would be a loss. I mean, I'd have to let go of that because when you're you're dead and gone and in the afterlife, it you really can't you know, you, you've let go of that life. So I guess I'd have sort of mixed feelings about that. Uh, I think that in the biggest picture, though, I would uh, welcome being back home, being back with uh, my eternal life, and, and literally being back to my real eternal self. Uh, that would be, I think, probably the, the overriding positive about uh, my own personal death. So they would, they might be saying, okay, you got, you got more work to do. Let's just say it happened today, you know, t- later tonight. They would go, you got more work to do, but, but maybe this is what you can imprint in your mind. This is what I'm going to, if that happened, yeah. I'm going to be like, well, let me at least, at least bask in it for a little while longer before I go back. Hold on. <laughs> That'd be good. And yeah, that's right. I mean, that could happen. And I, I absolutely understand from near-death experiences the profound meaning and importance of our earthly life, even if it's difficult, uh, even if there are struggles, which we all have in our earthly life, every single yeah. person on the planet. And yet it's so important. We're, we're here for a meaning and a purpose, and, and there's a greater picture. And so if if I were uh, to have a life-threatening event and had like 10 or 12 percent of near-death experiencers encounter, you need to go back, there's more for you to do, your work's not done. I would embrace that because I know that's coming from the loving other side, that they have my best interest in mind, best interest of the world. And perhaps somewhat reluctantly, I would come back and uh, return to my earthly life for who knows how long. And, you know, who knows, maybe talk to some shows again in the future. So, yeah, that would be uh, that I would that that'd be what I would do. That's a good imprint. So that would be what I guess there you go. Just imprinted here. Great. There you go. You're going to think about that more and more now. I know you are. It's Dr. Jeffrey Long that we're talking to, the leading near-death experience researcher and New York Times bestselling author. His books, God in the Afterlife, The Groundbreaking New Evidence for God and Near-Death Experience, also Evidence of the Afterlife, The Science of Near-Death Experiences, his links, spiritualityandhealth.org, adcrf.org, N-D-E. RF.org, O-B-E-R-F.org. If that sounds like that's crazy, Connie, just go to our website and you can uh, see all that there. We have open lines coming up for you shortly. But before then, we're still sticking around with Dr. Jeffrey Long learning about the afterlife. And now we want to get into the newer stuff. I actually wanted to get into your newer stuff earlier, right, Jeff? But I had so many other questions I had to ask you that were were just, let's do an amazing Kreskin moment that was just burning in my mind to ask you for for a while. Um, What is the new, all this research that you've done, and you're constantly into it, what have you learned now that you can tell us that is new and different? And I have to ask this too. How does and does it, does AI jump into this realm as well? Oh, that is a great question, Connie. AI or artificial intelligence is starting to impact our lives in a whole variety of ways and certainly in the future will be impacting more and more. And AI, artificial intelligence, is certainly already a significant tool in my near-death experience research. What we get when we do our survey on the website is a huge amount of narrative responses to a particular question. Well, what do you do with that? 
Uh, scientifically, you need to go through every single response, categorize them, and get the major themes. What are the major, if you will, most common things that people are saying uh, in their near-death experience, say to a question about, has your life changed after your near-death experience in any way? So I started using artificial intelligence to analyze large amounts of text. And to my amazement, uh, I've gotten some really positive, good findings. It, it seems to be uh, right up there with what you could do if you do the very careful scientific method of reading every narrative response to these survey questions and writing it all out and, and finding themes. So uh, with this, I'm able to, with artificial intelligence, uh, getting another different perspective on that very important question, what what happens after your near-death experience, what happens for after effects. Uh, and what I'm finding is that there's far more varied changes in people's lives than I think prior researchers ever knew. I mean, in prior research, they just asked questions about specific changes that they might have had. Uh, for example, less materialistic, uh, less fear of death, increased belief of an afterlife, obviously. And yet, uh, there seems to be so much more. It seems to impact their life in a lot of other ways. And artificial intelligence is helping me to be at the leading edge of that type of research. You know, there's so many, like like you talk to the people that have come back, but there's so many other people that are like, I love it here, I'm staying. <laughs> and we have to deal with the grief on this side and like, oh no, oh no, because most of most people don't have that knowledge of it's wonderful over there and there's something happening. There's so many people that think it just stops. They they think it just stops, which is yeah. absolutely crazy to me. I mean, stop and think about yourself right now. If If you can go deep enough within yourself, you can feel that you are. It's so hard to explain, isn't it, that you are, are right now, you are, you, you are. How can that ever end? How do you put that in words? You, you would be better at it with me than, than me. Yeah, I mean, we have that, our whole identity, that awareness of who we are. It seems to be all that we are. It's what we know in our earthly life. And it's so sad that people think that's it. And when they come to the end of their physical life, uh, that's it, that they don't really have something beyond. And that's the glorious news about near-death experience is that we're far more than our physical earthly life, that we have that eternal existence that preceded our earthly life here. Uh, it's our, if you will, our heritage, and yet it's also our destiny. It's where we will ultimately return our real home after we die here. I mean, you know, for people that think life ends at the end of our earthly life, I mean, good gosh, just listen to this show again. Uh, over and over, we're talking about the evidence that for the reality of an afterlife. Uh, certainly, you know, you, there's a, a lot of good books, a lot of good media presentations about near-death experiences. But near-death experiences are, in my opinion, the strongest line of evidence that we have for the reality of an afterlife. Uh, and again, by the time you studied thousands and thousands of near-death experiences, I have and other researchers are, you're, you're back to that basic scientific principle, that being what's real is consistently observed. And the consistent message of an afterlife is so deep in near-death experiences, uh, I have to consider that an established fact. Is there something in the, in the teachings, in the school, in the universities that people go to, in the schools that people go to, like, you know, to learn to be a doctor? Do they say things in a way of, well, this is the end, and and when it ends, the brain, what happens is the – do they explain away the afterlife? I know I've heard it in documentaries. I know I've heard it in shows on 60 Minutes or, you know, I don't know if it was exactly 60 Minutes, but the shows where the doctors will say – Oh, it's only their brain reacting and pulling up memories and and pulling up things that uh, you know it's just the brain doing stuff. They yeah. don't. They just don't want to admit that there's something else. What is it that teaches them to think that it's over? Who are these people that just want to stop it? These are the people that haven't listened to shows like this, that are not aware of the huge 
amount of evidence for the reality of near-death experience and its consistent message of an afterlife. And it's very sad. Here's my message to the skeptics that think that all we are is our physical brain function, and when it shuts down at the end of life, it's over. For skeptics, they've proposed over, believe it or not, Connie, 30 different so-called skeptical explanations of near-death experience. I've heard them all. You name it, physiological explanations, cultural, uh, psychological explanations. Well, now the reason there's over 30 of these skeptical explanations floating around is that there's no one or several of these so-called psychological, physiological explanations of near-death experience, if you will, brain function explanations of near-death experience. None of them make sense, even to the group of skeptics collectively. I mean, think about that. If they really had some explanation of near-death experience based on brain function, you wouldn't have over 30 of these different alternative and often contradictory skeptical explanations floating around. I mean, the bottom line is physical brain function doesn't explain any of these aspects of near-death experience that we've been talking about tonight, let alone the totality of them. And it's really sad that that the, you know, the scientific community has not embraced it more when, when you have such a mountain of evidence. In fact, the reality of evidence for near-death experience is actually much greater than the evidence that, deli- that drives my medical clinical decisions in managing cancer patients. I mean, the evidence is that solid, Connie. Wow, you have so much going on. I, gosh, it'd be so fun to be a part of what you do, to just get right, like I said, the front line. You are right there. So the soul, whatever you want to call it, the soul, the consciousness, I know a lot of people have different names for what that magic is. Whatever that magic is, I call it the soul. Yep, that breath, too. yeah, yeah. It's, it's the soul. When the soul is in you, it allows not only consciousness, the, it, it, it allows you to think, you to live, to see, to enjoy, to feel. And without it, once it goes away, I mean, it, that's what keeps your body moving and having fun and swimming and and just moving. It move that magic moves your body. Your body is that vehicle, that individual vehicle. That once you pass on, this is me. Once you pass on, you join the. I don't know. I don't know if you just join and connect with everything else. Or not? What What do you see? But once it's gone, your body just stops. It 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 doesn't move anymore. It doesn't it does it's just it's no longer alive. It just dies. It just get, it stiffens up. Yeah, that yeah, magic absolutely. of the soul is amazing. That's that's yeah, that's I, the miracle. It really is. I mean, it's like we share a brain, Connie. That's exactly what I think. So, absolutely. The soul uh, is that, as you, as you said, that immaterial part of who we really are. It's that connection with eternity that we all have. It's that real essence. It's that real driving force of who and what we all are. It's that part of us that can't die that will live on eternally in an afterlife. So the, it, it's such a critical part of what makes us all humans that you'd think there'd be far more people interested in this and far less skeptics poo-pooing all this because it's so important. It's such a critical part. Um, We talked earlier about even a Pew survey back in 2021 found 72 percent of Americans believed that near-death experiences were the real soul departing the body. So uh, it's, it's fascinating that the word has gotten out to the public such that the significant majority of people do accept the reality of a soul and that the soul can depart at the time of a near-death experience. So I guess it's almost like Connie science has to catch up what is so widely known in discussions on shows like this and the general knowledge of the American public. Well, what has made these skeptics skeptics? I think part of it is they're sort of like, I guess I can sort of identify that with the skeptics as a physician. I mean, every day I have to make decisions that are life and death in treating patients' cancer. And so you really want to 
look at what the best evidence is. And I think the problem with skeptics is they don't understand the evidence for the reality of the afterlife, for near-death experiences, of soul, of that very part thing. And they just don't haven't spent the time to really study the, the mountain of evidence that shows the reality of all that, uh, to think about it, to understand how that affects themselves. It's very sad. I mean, it's almost like they spend their whole life um, reading their literature that's focused just on their particular small uh, slice of intellectual knowledge that drives their medical practice, their PhD uh, research uh, practice. So it's it's they just don't seem to be have like tunnel vision, if you will, and not really able to think about, conceive of, or be aware of that big picture that important big picture, uh, the concept of a soul and the reality that we're so much more than our physical brain. I've seen it with going to the alien world and the alien abductor, uh, abductees. I've seen it in those of us that have seen uh, the Bigfoot too, where they just want to deny it. It's, uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage to say, hey, this is what I saw on the other side. It takes a lot of courage to say, I saw this Bigfoot. It takes a lot of courage to say, I saw this alien or a praying mantis. You hear stories constantly, you know, and I'm talking a praying mantis that is, that stands up 18 foot tall. Well, maybe not 18. I don't know, but 12 foot tall or 15 foot tall or 10 foot tall. When people see these things and they have the guts enough to say it and it has affected them so much and then they're just denied, they're just pushed down. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. These people, where do they come up with being able to say no? What what happened to people trusting other people, listening to other people, or at least open enough to go, okay, let me put it in, let me just store it and see what happens in the future. Maybe I might have that same thing happen. Where did all that go? Where did the mistrust happen? I don't, I, yeah. uh, it drives me crazy. You know, and, and it got me too, Connie, geez. I mean, here you are with phenomenon that very credible people talk about. Uh, in, in a lot of these things, talking about like aliens and alien abductions, I mean, this is something that is difficult for people to talk about. Um, they, they get a lot of pushback from people. I mean, they have to really believe that. They really have to have experienced it before they're going to go out on a limb and share that. And I think one real validating thing that you can see from people that have these paranormal experience is look at how it changed their life. Nobody changes their life based on an event in their life that they don't believe in, that they strongly doubt, uh, that they think, you know, could be explainable by physical brain function. So people that have these paranormal phenomena, exactly like what you just described there, when they have their big changes in their life, that is a huge indicator that their experience was not only real, it really happened, but also the person experiencing it believed it and changed their lives, their beliefs, their values in response to what they experienced. You can't fake the after effects, if you will, of a, of a paranormal experience. When people see those changes in people's lives, uh, that's, if you will, a significant line of proof that what they're describing really happened. And moreover, they're changing their values, beliefs, understanding in response to what they experienced. And it truly changes them. It truly changes them. Do you notice that uh, people that have come back and they're just ecstatic, do you notice that they want to tell the world it or do they say, I, I don't even care to tell the world because they're not going to listen to me anyway. I'm going to take this and just be closer to my family, to my, to my friends and just, just live it as, as much to the fullest as possible. What do you see kind of all kinds of that and yeah, different absolutely. stories? You know, and that's a really good point. I think for all the listeners that have had that profound, significant spiritual paranormal event in your life, Try to find people that are open-minded, that will listen, that will believe you. I mean, you know, people you know have believed everything else you've said in your life. I mean, good gosh, this is just one more thing. And it's, it's a, you know, a profound paranormal spiritual thing. And, and what they're sharing is important. I mean, as you said, they're often people that have these experiences joyous to share it with other people. They're profoundly positive messages. It sort of expands our consciousness. I mean, wow, there's 
things in the world we hadn't even thought of, aliens, life on other planets, uh, things on this earth that, that we still don't fully understand. And these are the foundation phenomena, initial observations that are so important to help us to understand, if you will, the bigger picture of life on this earth and the bigger picture of life throughout the universe, even on other planets. You know, I've always talked about uh, uh, paranormal things and aliens and this and that. And my dad, before he passed, would just be like, uh, <laughs> you know, he didn't believe any. And my mom was good with it, but my dad was like, uh. but I know that once he passed, I, I know that I know I felt it. He was on board with me and I could tell. I knew as soon as he passed, he went, wow, you're right on target. Don't stop. Stay where you are. That, that's excellent. What a great validation of everything you believe. And I mean, you know, look at aliens, uh, life on other planets. I, I I'm sheepishly will admit, Connie, I used to not believe that. But there's such a mountain of evidence that I've encountered. As a man of science, I follow evidence and reasoning. And the evidence is overwhelming for life on other planets. In fact, We've had several near-death experiencers describe as part of their experience very vivid descriptions of life on other planets. I mean, I still almost get goosebumps when I recall one near-death experiencer <laughs> who visited a planet that was totally water. There wasn't land on this planet, and the description of the intelligent, literally loving life that she encountered in this water world uh, is absolutely gripping. Yeah, so, again, water world. The, the, the evidence uh, for the reality of life, I mean, there's just such a bigger picture of this universe. All you have to do is listen to people that have encountered it. Yes. And, and learn. Yeah, exactly right. So we have open lines coming up. Do you mind staying up another hour? I know you're on the East Coast. Do you mind staying oh, up another hour and talking with people with open lines? I would, I would love to do that. This is such a fantastic show. I would love to hear the questions and comments from the listeners. That would be great. And real quick, where do people find you? Uh, website would be nderf.org. Open lines happening now, and Dr. Jeffrey Long, our guest for tonight, is going to stick around for an hour and answer your questions. Jeff, is there anything else that you want to say that you didn't get to say yet before we start taking calls? No, I think we've really, it's been a great show, a lot of discussion about near-death experience, including some leading-edge research that we've talked about. Um, you know, I would have to say that what we've talked about, near-death experience and its powerful evidence for the reality of an afterlife, is uh, perhaps the most powerful positive message for all of humanity that is even conceivable. So uh, very good news that we're bringing forward here. But gosh, Connie, let's go ahead and take some questions and see what comes. Let's do it. First-time caller, Robert, out of San Antonio. San Antonio! I was at KISS and KOOL for a very for a short time, but I was there, Robert. So welcome. You're on the air. Thank you for taking my call, Connie. Um, Dr. Long, um, I will get your response off the air, but um, I was just wondering. I'm, I do believe in the near-death experiences that it happens to people, but I also believe that once we actually pass, we go to one place or another, and tonight, as you were talking about the people that you've heard about, you've interviewed out of the hundreds, they've all talked about love and light and peace. My question is, when it comes to people like Hitler, Dahmer, Bundy, I can't see them passing away and having love and light surround them. So I guess my question is, have you ever spoke to anybody who has had a negative experience? And a good question. Take your response yeah. off the air. Yeah, good question, Robert. These are all people. Near-death experiences are like uh, normal, everyday people. We obviously haven't had anybody have a life-threatening event, a near-death experience that was like a Hitler or Dahmer. So I'd have to say we don't absolutely know. We're, we're based on near-death experiences shared by people that, like the great majority of people on Earth, are, are decent uh, reasonably loving people. Of course, they may have their, their shortcomings, but they're nothing like a Hitler or Dahmer. So I think that's some, uh, you know, we don't really know. I think certainly we're responsible and accountable for our actions in the afterlife. And I think for the Hitlers and the Dahmers and the people that are profoundly antisocial, it may be a bit of a rough go. Uh, the frightening, even hellish near-death experiences, while they've been reported, are very rare 
Uh, even in my 4,000 experiences that I have, there's only a couple dozen that are clearly documented as being awareness or encountered of, of with a truly hellish realm. So from the near-death experiences, those seem to exist, but I think that's only for the, uh, as best I can tell, and again, this is getting into speculation, uh, it seems to be for the extreme of humanity at being antisocial. Have you had any type of um, findings of something similar to, like, purgatory? Yeah, that's a good question. The, uh, there has been uh, many, uh, many near-death experiences talk about what's called like a void. There seems to be, and it's not frightening, it's sort of, there's just an, an emptiness, and they often will describe feeling loving or feeling that, you know, like that maybe they'll see a light in the distance, but it's not it's not like other near-death experiences where there's often other spiritual beings around them or a beautiful, unearthly realm. I mean, so beautiful, I mean, like they often describe colors that are beautiful beyond anything on Earth. So th- those are much more common. Uh, you kind of wonder if these void experiences are like a purgatory. It's sort of like an in-between a waiting area, if you will. So, again, I think with near-death experiences, there's so many variety of things described uh, that, that I think at least some of what's described could certainly fit the concept of purgatory. West of the Rockies, let's talk to Gina Marie out of Washington State. Hi there, Gina. You're on the air. Hello. Um, peace and love and healing and God bless to everyone and everything everywhere. Um, I, I want to tell a quick story and then um, and ask the doctor a question at the end. Um, so I had a friend, Scott, who was dying, and he was so afraid to die. And so I um, ended up going to him every night after work, and I'd stayed with him a few hours for a week. Um, and then the first night that I went there, he greeted me with, a, do you want a balloon? That's important for the end of the story. But um, he then expressed his fear of dying to me. And um, I told him that it's a beautiful, loving experience and um, that he would be encompassed in pure energy love and white light and that his animals would greet him first and then his relatives and friends. Um, so every night when I went to him, he would ask me to tell him, um, tell him about it again, tell him what would happen. And I did. It was almost like telling a bedtime story to somebody. And the last night I went, I knew he was going to die that night. I'm kind of intuitive myself. And um, so I stayed the whole night into the morning. And about two hours before he died, he said, oh, it's so bright. And I said, are you seeing the white light, honey? And he said, it's so very bright. And I said, see, I told you that would happen. And then one hour before he died, he started talking to someone. I waited, and then I asked him who he was talking to, and he said his grandma. And I said, see, I told you you'd be greeted by your loved ones. And, of course, he was no longer afraid. And an hour after that, I talked him over to the other side, straight into heaven. And when I um, got home, I when I finally went home, um, I went into my bathroom and I turned on my angel nightlight and I looked down on the floor and there was a balloon he had left me on my floor. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And I just wanted to say it's like the most beautiful, loving thing that you can do for another person. And I wanted to ask you and the doctor, have you ever had a bit of sweet blessing of verbally walking anyone to the other side to heaven? Oh, wow. You know, Gina, thanks for sharing that incredible story. Scott, so fortunate as he died that he had such a loving presence as you. I've never had any, you know, actually been talking through someone as you did with Scott. So that's just beautiful. The uh, What Scott was visualizing at the end, the light and talking with a deceased loved one, uh, these are reported in what's called deathbed visions. And there's quite a few of these reported. They're certainly real. They're part of that spiritual spectrum. So uh, that's certainly really, for, I think for many people dying, as, as you noticed, Gina, part of the transition and a, and a very loving, uh, wonderful thing that can help calm people down and, and open them up to the reality of being reunited with their deceased loved ones. And that balloon you described, geez, Gina, I almost had uh, goosebumps. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, well, you know, we can, <laughs> there's a, a sort of in the spectrum of what we call after-death communications. In other words, that can be how the deceased, or there's a communication of the deceased lovingly reached out, it's sort of like that hello from that afterlife, and it can be expressed in a variety of ways. That balloon is just awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that. 
Yeah, so nice. That was Gina Marie. Let's go east of the Rockies and talk with Robert out of New York City, out of the city. Hey there, Robert. Oh, he has left. Let's go to uh, let's go up to wild card line number two. Talk to Janice out of Washington State. Hey there, Janice. How are you? Hi, Connie. Just fine, thank you. Hi, Doctor Long. Uh, I've really been enjoying the program, and for years I've been studying the near death. Well, not really studying, but reading books on the near death experience, and I think it's a wonderful thing to know because it's so much easier when a loved one is on their way to, uh, I think it makes you less, um, you know, sad about somebody going when they know where they're going. And back on July of 11th, I think it was 2012, we had a Brian Belitzos on interviewing him. He was talking about the Urantia book, and um, I got that after that interview, and it answered so many questions uh, that I think you've been talking about tonight. I think, you know, the Christian religion was established on uh, when Jesus was telling the disciples about what's going to happen after death and even proved it when he died and came back. And Mm -hmm. we are humans having a spiritual experience here on earth, not... Or no, we're not humans having a spiritual experience. We are spirits having a human experience. And I think that when people realize that life goes on and that we aren't going to die, it's going to make life so much easier. Oh, absolutely. And Janice, I'm going to highlight that very important concept again. We really are spirits having a human experience. And I think that's an important perspective to keep Janice, exactly like you said, when you encounter loved ones that have life-threatening illnesses or die, uh, I mean, it may reduce the grief a little bit, but it's certainly, in the bigger picture of things, highly reassuring in the long run. Uh, We're all going to be back together. We're all part of that afterlife, just like you said. When we were talking about uh, the magic, the soul that is in the body and and has you walking around in this vehicle that we have and moving around and having fun and having this experience. Have you ever know? have you guys noticed ever that when the person does die, even if they come back, you know, they're gone, they come back. Is there any change in the weight of the person? Right. That was a uh, thinking of some years ago. In fact, there was even some, efforts at weighing the physical body. And the bottom line is, with with several investigations of that, there really is no weight of loss. I mean, there would be like loss of water vapor, which could affect like maybe a few grams. But really, the bottom line is the soul is immaterial. And when it departs from the physical body, it has zero weight, zero at all. I mean, it's part mm-hmm. of a non-physical afterlife realm. So not surprisingly, Modern studies find absolutely no change physically in the weight of the body, and yet, importantly, that immaterial part of the of the body, the soul, uh, that's what goes on. The it, weight doesn't prove it. It's just the in numerous counts that we're getting from near-death experiencers and from other spiritual experiences. Well, that soul magically makes the body do what it does, you know, just, you know, like I'm moving my arms over here and everything. And that's because I got that soul going on there. As soon as it's gone, the body just stops. It just stops and and stiffens up and that's it. Yeah, it's that's it. like a doll. It's not real. And, and And yet when the soul goes on, very important concept. You know, a lot of people worry, well, when we die, when we go to the afterlife, well, what about, I mean, we have had a personality, we have a self-identity. That's all part of the soul. The soul is incorporated and part of all of our life's experiences. I mean, that's why in near-death experiences, there's so-called life review, where you can see a part or even all of your prior life. That's us. That's part of ourselves eternally. So who we are, everything in our earthly life is part of that soul that lives eternally. Wild card line number one, Roberta out of Tucson, Arizona. Hey there, you are on the air with Coast to Coast AM. Thank you. If a person is married more than once to a spouse that has been married more than once, who gets together with who in the afterlife? Yeah, 
Uh, you know, that's a, a very interesting question, Robert, and we touched on that earlier in this evening's discussion. The In the afterlife, it's, it's completely different. It's a non-physical realm, and yet it's far more loving. There's far more unity or connection of everyone and everything. So as best I can tell from near-death experiences, that's simply not an issue. We're all loved. We're all loved equally in the afterlife. I mean, here in, it, it's a difficult concept here on Earth where you have a special loved one, and there's sort of a concept you can only love one person on Earth specially. Rules are all different in the afterlife. Everybody is loved. Everybody is loved equally. There's no stepchilds in the afterlife. I mean, we're, uh, however many marriages you had, there were or how many spouses there were, they're all going to be okay with each other. They're all going to be together in a very positive, sharing, loving environment in the afterlife. Good questions. I'm telling you, we got some really good questions. Let's go to wildcard line number three and talk to Paul out of Niagara Falls, Canada. Hello. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Long for all his work. He, I can't believe there's someone doing this kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm speaking as a, a widower for four years now. So mm -hmm. I think uh, you can imagine where I'm coming from when I say that. Um, I... I had two questions, really, and, and a guy earlier talked about Hitler, and um, my question was about more about judgment. Like, when you, when we cross over, and I know we have this life review. I've heard much about that, and we kind of, like, judge ourselves in that life review. Like, we feel a lot of shame. We feel a lot of guilt. Is there – has anyone come back from a, a – a, a, um, a near-death experience and talked about the kind of judgment that evangelical, uh, evangelical Christians talk about. Like, for example, if you didn't believe in Jesus, or if you didn't believe in the word of Jesus, then you you don't get to go to heaven, that kind of thing. And my second question is uh, totally unrelated to that. Earlier, we you were talking about animals and, um, and pets, and I'm wondering... Uh, this might be a bit of a difficult question to answer because maybe even Dr. Long, you've never uh, considered this, but how far down the line does, does it go in terms of life? I mean, we have animals, but then we also have like insects, and then you can go down even further into cells, and you can go down even further into bacteria. And I'm wondering, like, do these all have souls? Is, is there any evidence that uh, I, I think I heard that our bodies have something like seven trillion cells or something. So when we die, does, does this, are there seven trillion souls that go up to heaven or something like that? Uh, and anyway, that's and a bit Jeff, of a ridiculous question. No, all good. But Jeff, as you answer, we only have like a minute. So if you can. Okay, good questions, Paul. I'll have to do it quick. Um, in in a life review, there's uh, as in other parts of near death experience, essentially never. A sense of judgment. Uh, the judgment is the near-death experience for themselves. They almost never have external judgment. And as far as like how far down the lifeline, bacteria, insects. I think pets and and loved ones, people. It's that love connection that creates that uh, environment. I think there's always a connection and unity of everything and everyone. And yet, like these insects or cells, don't have consciousness. So you can't have that sharing of consciousness in the afterlife. I, I think that's the answer. Interesting. Hmm. Because I've made friends with ants and little bugs and little things like that. I'm pretty good with that. <laughs> but I, I understand what you're saying. And he had some really great questions. Open lines on Coast to Coast AM. Connie Willis here along with Dr. Jeffrey Long sticking around, our leading near-death experience researcher and New York Times bestselling author. His books, God in the Afterlife, The Groundbreaking New Evidence for God and Near-Death Experience, and also Evidence of the Afterlife, The Science of Near-Death Experiences. Uh, is that are uh, your books on Amazon? Oh, absolutely. They're available for anybody that would like to purchase them. And you also have your all your different websites. You can check those out on uh, coasttocoastam.com. Do you also have a YouTube channel or no? No, I don't. I'm, I'm a practicing full-time physician. Yeah, I'd love you're to too do busy. That, I just don't have time, but yeah. What is your education, your background? Yeah, I'm a medical doctor, so after 
four years of undergraduate training. You, you get a college degree, and then you go on to medical school, and that's another four years. Forever, Actually, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, and people don't know this, but that's not the end of the line. After you, you graduate no. from medical school, there's residency training to learn your specialty, and that can range from anywhere from three to seven years, uh, even beyond medical school. For me, it was five years more. Mm, and where'd you go? Went to the University of Iowa. So that was my college of medicine there and also did my residency training in radiation oncology. Amazing. And, you know, you never stop learning. You are constantly learning and and you're out you're learning outside of the box as well. Oh, absolutely. And that's a really good point. Uh, You you never really stop learning. Um, The practice of medicine, my medical specialty, radiation oncology, has just changed radically. We're curing more people than was ever possible before when I started my practice decades ago. So exciting and yet challenging to keep up with the leading edge of cancer treatment today. Okay, so you're going to imprint in your mind just in case something happens where you see the light but you're sent back. When you're in that light or whoever's around you, you've got to ask, what's the cure? What's the cure? Give me the cure before I head back. That okay. would be, I, would, I would love it if, I, if that happened. <laughs> in uh, print, in, in print. Let's go back to the lines, <laughs> open lines. Wild card line number four, Ryan out of Van Nuys, California. Hey there, Ryan. You're all, you're on the air. What's up, Connie? You hear me? I do. Such a pleasure. I called once before, and uh, it's strictly just a flirt with you, but I do have a question. Uh <laughs> For you and Dr. Jeff, if I can call him Dr. Jeff, I, I remember that. Um, for Dr. Jeff, uh, with, with NDE, NDEs, near-death experiences, it, uh, have there been any correlation done with uh, uh, the person being intoxicated, uh, drunk, or that? And the reason I, I'm, I'm saying this is because I'm being completely transparent. I've had a couple of drinks tonight, and I, and I presume some of your callers do as well. But uh, in the passenger seat, hitting my uh, head on a windshield, uh, they didn't think I should have survived it. But I kind of remembered the whole thing. I was I was almost above it, seeing the guys pull me out of the passenger seat. Um, so I was just curious if there any studies with that. And then we'll do it afterwards. I know how this goes. Um, and then, Connie, my question to you is, next time you go Bigfoot hunting, can I come with you? Because I absolutely adore you. Um, I don't, I don't know if you're married, you probably are, but I want to go Bigfoot hunting with you. <laughs> so let me answer mine real quick and then we'll go to you, Jeff. Uh, mine, if you want to go Bigfooting with me, join my show, Blue Rock Talk. It's a membership show and that's the kind of thing we do. We live investigate and we go out there whether, uh, you know, it's, it's a live virtual thing. So you can join right there and watch as it happens live. So, Dr. Jeff, <laughs> go ahead with yeah, your answer. I'll, I'll take it away with part two, Ryan. Yeah, hey, you had a near-death experience, it sounds like, with that car yeah. crash and your consciousness over your body. So thanks for sharing that. That's definitely a, a, an, an, an out-of-body experience associated with a near-death experience. And you had another thing about, like, you know, the intoxication. We've had people that have had near-death experiences as a result of say, narcotic overdoses, and you can even have a near-death experience occurring while under general anesthesia. And under those mind-affecting drugs, you would think that it would affect the near-death experience, but it doesn't. They have the same degree of typically supernormal lucidity that you would have for near-death experiences occurring under all other circumstances. And, you know, all of that's just one more line of evidence that what's described in near-death experience absolutely is not part of physical brain function whatsoever. Ryan, thanks for all the call the, the call and all the questions and uh, that you're still with us. Wildcard line number five, lots of people calling in for you there, Jeff, is John hey. out of Houston. Hey there, John, you're on the air. Hey, how's it going, Connie and uh, Dr. Jeffrey? It's an honor Good. to talk to you. Um, thanks. My main question is um, talk about uh, – people that that have taken their lives or um, friends that have uh, overdosed on drugs, like, is like, what, you know, what happens with that, you know? Yeah, sure. There's been a lot of good studies about near-death experiences that occur as a result of suicide. And 
they have typical near-death experiences. They are generally like all others in terms of content. We're back to that overriding principle of near-death experiences, that being that they're almost always not non-judgmental in terms of judgment from an external being that's, that's present in the near-death experience. So uh, having said that, people that have a near-death experience as a result of a suicide attempt almost never commit suicide again. And that's an, if, for people that have a suicide attempt but don't have a near-death experience, they're much more likely to attempt suicide again. And the reason for that seems to be if they have a near-death experience, they come back increasingly aware that our earthly life, you know, however difficult it is, in fact, so difficult they attempted suicide, that earthly life is really meaningful and significant to the point that they really need to, if you will, gut it out and live it, the life, no matter how difficult it is. And near-death experiencers are aware of that and are much, much less likely to attempt suicide again. Now, Jeff, I've got some people that have uh, emailed me separately, and they've been talking about the the bad experiences. Even um, I was talking to you about this before, our uh, Project Stargate, Lynn Buchanan. I always talk about Lynn because he's a friend of mine, but he also just amazed me as a remote viewer for the military for Project Stargate. They were given targets, or at least he was given targets um, in remote viewing. He's a military guy that would take them him to uh, the targets where, of course, he doesn't know what the targets are, but the targets were a minute before someone died, a minute after someone died, 12 minutes after someone died, three years after someone died, two weeks after they died, you know, and so on. They gave different times and he would see what he would see. And he saw many different things. He said some things were like heaven. Uh, and it's in his book, The Seventh Sense. Sense. Um, he would that he spoke of people seeing heaven like things, and he also spoke of purgatory. He spoke of just blank, and and I think if I remember properly, somebody was blank and blank and blank, and you know, they kept moving up the the time, weeks, months, blank, blank, blank. Twelve years old, all of a sudden could see you know something at twelve, and he had talked about. Uh, that could mean something like, you know, the tribal type things a long time ago and just the celebration of kids at 13 or 12 or 13 coming into a new light and a new life. He kind of thought that could have come from there where maybe the soul was thrown in at that point and it was conscious or something aware of life at, at the age of 12 or 13. You might want to really learn a little bit more about that too. I know that would interest you, but he also mentioned something similar to hell and some people have been writing and asking about that, that they know people that have seen it and, and, um, uh, I actually know somebody that saw it. He came back and he became a priest. <laughs> so, wow. so I know you said you've seen, you, you know about some of that, but you're yeah. just saying it's not as much. Yeah. It, at least in, in, in your studies. My, yeah. In my study. And, and you can understand people would be reluctant to share an especially hellish near death experience. I think people right. are a lot more inclined to talk about or share on a website, uh, more positive near death experiences and, and all that you're sharing there, Connie, you know, thanks for sharing that. Very important. It really reminds me that regarding the afterlife, what we don't know far exceeds what we do know. So yes. it's very important to come at that question and understanding from many different approaches, just like what you described there. Uh, I think that's what's going to get us closer to truth is as we look not just at near-death experiences, but from all the other experiences that inform us in a variety of ways about life after death and what that's all about. What we Again, what we don't know exceeds what we do know, but we're certainly on a journey toward understanding. Wildcard line number three, let's talk to Jay out of Indiana. Who's your, hey there, Jay, you're on the air. Hi, Connie. Hi, doctor. Boy, you're the a perfect person to answer this question for me, given the topic and the fact that you're a doctor. I've always wanted to be an organ donor but I've always hesitated because I don't think we know enough about what happens immediately after death. In other words, and I want to make light of this, this is very important to me, but what if I'm uh, deceased and they begin to remove things from me and I'm going down this tunnel of light and someone says, it's not yet your time. I got to tell them, (laughs) 
Yeah, but look, you don't understand. They're taking stuff out of me back there. <laughs> okay. That's, I'm Jenny, sorry that I'm love, laughing, but it's kind well, of funny, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I love that. That's a great question. Um, yes. I love this show. You always get questions I hadn't even thought of. But, uh, Jay, I, I'm, I'm an organ donor, Jay. And, you know, I have no concerns about that. When, when you're like going down the tunnel and said your time's not up, you need to go back, the other side is overwhelmingly vastly more intelligent and aware of the condition of our physical body, you know, even that, that we are, maybe even the doctors. So if you're told it's time to go back, you still have a physical body that will accommodate your consciousness, return of soul to the physical body. So it's really not a problem. I, I encourage everybody to be an organ donor because you're literally, I mean, in, in medicine, I've seen that literally change people's lives, save people's lives. And there's no concern from my perspective about the afterlife or near death, being a near-death experience researcher. Uh, and believe me, they have very strict criteria to make sure you're physically dead and your body's not going to be able to be reanimated before they donate organs. So I would encourage organ donation. And, uh, I sure uh, signed up. I love the way he asked that question. That was great. <laughs> That's great. I just, you got to love these questions. Keep it coming, folks. This is great. <laughs> you got to go back. No, wait a minute. They're taking things out of me. I'm not going back. <laughs> Wild card great. line number four. Let's talk to Rick out of New Jersey. Hey there, Rick. You're on with Coast to Coast AM. Well, I was thinking about this show with souls and life essence and stuff. And uh, I was wondering if like... Uh, Cro Magnums or Neanderthals or Ithacapicus man is two million years old. If they had souls and that they're up in heaven in a segregated area or like they band to the back of the bus or are they allowed to mix with them? What do you think? You know, what's going on with them? You know? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. You know, humankind evolving from, you know, the substantially yeah. lower life forms to the, the life that we have today. I, I think as best I can tell from near death experiences, uh, all life, uh, everything and everyone is sort of a part of a connective one in the afterlife. And we're all together. And I think that includes even life forms that were, you know, to use a term, less developed than we are today. So I think you're going to see those Neanderthals. You're going to see those Cro-Magnons. Um, uh, and, and I think that's that, that's a part of uh, – they had souls. I'm quite confident about that. And I'm sure that they had an afterlife too. But, hey, Rick – uh, when you're there, when I'm there, we can ask them, see what they say, the <laughs> Neanderthals of the world. Did you all draw those pictures on the caves or did somebody else? What, <laughs> yeah, how, did we'll, you we'll run from answered. dinosaur? <laughs> we'll get those burning questions answered in the afterlife that were like, are unanswerable in our earthly life. That's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I believe that you know all. Once you go over, you don't have any questions. You know, you you just know. Yeah. Have you have you found that out when people come oh, back? Do they absolutely. say they have a knowing of everything? Okay. Yeah. In in the afterlife, over and over, we hear about what's called a, a universal knowledge. People will have a sense of knowing questions to everything, uh, all the great mysteries, and they can even describe that they're processing, you know, scientific information, awareness, knowledge about things at a vastly greater level than they ever knew on Earth or could handle on Earth. Uh, and, and that's another thing that used to drive me nuts in my early NDE research is people would come back and they, they wouldn't really be able to retain knowledge of those insights, that universal knowledge. And finally, one near-death experiencer educated me and said, hey, it's like trying to put an ocean of knowledge into the teacup that's our human physical brain. It just You just can't hold it all. So that, That's that exactly helps. right. Yeah. I like that. Let me ask you this. When you talk about the experiences people have, you discuss, uh, you know, love and, and, and people that they know and knowledge and all this kind of stuff. Are they, are they seeing cities or, or, or buildings or anything yeah. like that? Or are we just floating well, around or what, what? No, that's a good question. In the, the afterlife, while it can be variably described, the common thing is it's, Got buildings, beautiful, uh, typically beautiful beyond anything on Earth. There may be flowers or colors in the plants that near-death experiencers say it's so beautiful. It could, they're colors that could not exist on Earth. Music also. They may describe music in the afterlife uh, realm that is far beyond any beauty of music that's even earthly possible. So it's, it's 
Uh, and again, their, their consciousness is accelerated. They're processing information, aware of information that would have been far beyond what our physical earthly brains could accommodate. But that's, that's fairly common. It's a fairly common theme in near-death experiences to be in these, again, beautifully, beautiful landscapes, building uh, other people around, analogous to Earth, and yet uh, non-physical and certainly quite different in, in a lot of ways in terms of so- its beauty. So we're like in a body again, and we recognize the other people because they're in a body again? Yeah, that they, they're they actually recognized as uh, they have a, a – again, it's a, it's, it's a non-physical realm, and I have to keep coming back. There's, there's nothing physical. Movement is non-physical. Communication in the afterlife is almost always like telepathic. It doesn't involve physical communication like talking and listening, uh, and yet the people often appear as a body – I think it's important to realize that many near-death experiencers will share that they, from time to time, will encounter a form, and the form will literally ask them, how would you like for me to appear to you? And so they they can choose how that happens. So I think while you see something that looks like your deceased loved one, I think they're far more than just that form that the near-death experiencer described. They're just seeing a particular manifestation of that soul that's the proper loving way for them to manifest for the near-death experiencer. In order to recognize, hey, Dr. Jeffrey Long, it's time to say goodbye, like real quick. Fantastic show, Connie. What a pleasure. Great questions. Great show. Really appreciate being here. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you again, and I know I'll have you on my shows too. Dr. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Long, thank you so much for being with us. 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 So much for being The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.